And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Coda, an author of five published books and several technical articles. He discovered the phenomenon of visual telepathy in 1970. Today, we're going to learn about it and more. Coda, thank you so much for being my guest today and welcome. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. All right. Let's start here. What is visual telepathy? Okay. Well, most people think of telepathy as sending thoughts or information from one person to another, but that's not how it works. I define telepathy as the merger of subjective perceptions between one or more people at the same time. So telepathy is a merger of subjective awareness. I think everybody knows the difference between objective and subjective. Objective is there's a chair, everyone can see it. But something like thoughts and emotions are subjective perceptions. So <clears throat> telepathy is the merger of subjective awareness. And visual telepathy is a merger of visual perception on a subjective level. So what it is, is I came up with this eye contact exercise. It's really simple, easy to do. Anybody can do it. And it causes distortions in the visual perception of the two people as they do it. So you're looking at someone's eye. You're trying to see their face as clearly as you see their eye without looking away from their eye. And when you're doing that, their face begins to change. <clears throat> and what happens is the changes happen to both people at the same time and have the same level of constantly varying intensity and emotional reactions to these visual changes, change the electrical capacitance in your skin. It's like, and when that's measured, it's like, uh, it's called electrodermal response. They use it in lie detector machines. So whenever you have an emotional reaction, a graph will go up and if you hook two people up to this, to the same machine, the graphs will match. So you're looking at another person, you're looking at their eye, you can see an area the size of their eye clearly, but the rest of their face is blurry. What you wanna do is expand that area of clear perception to include the whole face. When you do that, their face will start to change. There'll be lighter areas, darker areas, some the nose or a cheekbone will stand out. It's like, <laughs> Just the face will kind of hallucinate in a slow, gradual manner. And then at some point, it, the face starts to look like somebody else. <laughs> okay, And that's really mind-blowing. And there are very strong emotional reactions happen when you see the person in front of you turn into somebody else. And there's a very strong possibility that what you're looking at is that other person as they appeared in a different incarnation. There's no way to prove that, but that's what it feels like. And I kind of think of like if these near death experiences, everybody says that on the other side, there is no time. Everybody communicates with telepathy. And it's like, I think that's how the whole universe is basically set up. So when you're doing this exercise, you only going to look at one of their eyes, right? Right. I want to point out something about visual perception. It's just, you take a look around the room, you'll notice everything, you can see everything in the room clearly at the same, in one brief glance, everything's clear. Okay. But I want to try this little exercise. You take your thumb, look at the tip of your thumb, spread your fingers, and try to see your index finger without taking your eye off your thumb. If you try to do that, you'll notice you can't see the end of your index finger. You can only see an area about an inch across from that distance. So when you're looking at somebody's eye, you can only see their eye clearly. The rest of it is out of focus. When you looked around the room a minute ago, you thought you could see everything clear, but all you can see is about a foot across, depending on how big the room is. That's all you can see clearly. The rest of the room is a big blur. So what's going on is our subconscious mind is manufacturing the impression of a clear image so we can function in the world. Otherwise, we would be walking around with tunnel vision. So what this exercise does 
is it concentrates on what we actually see instead of what we think we're supposed to see. And it gives us a glimpse at the reality behind reality. Every now and then someone will post something on Facebook and it'll be like two or three sentences. The letters are turned backwards or there's not all the letters are there, but your brain can still fill in all the information and read the sentence. Yeah, I've seen that. That's How- kind of what happens is our subconscious mind refers to objects and shapes that we're familiar with and manufactures the impression of a clear image. But we don't actually see that at all. And if you if you think about what reality is, it's like we don't see reality the way it is either because we only see a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But we don't if we could see uh, infrared light, everything everything around us would glow like on heat sensitive cameras. Uh, dogs can hear sounds we don't hear. Uh, dolphins, bats, they see with echolocation. We have no idea what that looks like. Uh, there's just uh, the radio waves are everywhere around us. We don't see those. So the reality we see with our eyes is not the reality that's really there. There's much more going on that we don't perceive. Mm. So it's our brains and our subconscious mind manufacturing the impression of a clear image that makes us able to function in the world. So when you're doing this exercise with another person, when you start to see their face morph into some other face, is that happening to them when they're looking at your face back at the same time? Exactly the same time. And that's visual telepathy? Are you sharing that or or is that not part of the visual telepathy? If you think of telepathy as a merger of subjective perception, when their face is changing to you, your face is changing to them. The changes happen at the same times and have the same level of constantly varying intensity. And so, yeah, that's what makes it telepathy because the subjective perception, I can describe what you're seeing by describing what I'm seeing. So if I see your face change, I go, hey, your face just changed a lot. And I could just say, when I see your face change a lot, I can say, you just saw my face change because that the changes happen to both people at the same time. Mm, that's and cool. your emotional reactions also are duplicated. They're not duplicated, they're shared. If, if you think about consciousness as being like a, a, a field of energy that surrounds the body, like an aura or something, what happens when you're doing this is that you start to blend those two energy fields together. So your consciousness starts to begins to connect with somebody else. And then you start seeing people's face turning into somebody else, and that's really weird. What about people who claim that they're empathic and they feel other people's emotional states? I'm not saying it's it's not existing, but what do you think is happening there? And to follow that up, is that a two-way street or they're only feeling someone else's? It's, it's, a hap- it's a merger of awareness, okay? Now, if, say, I'm picking up somebody else's feelings, we're both feeling the same thing at the same time, but the other person may not know that I'm picking up on it. Hmm. But the feeling is shared. So that's how I think that would work. Do you think it's possible to prove that this telepathy is occurring? Yeah, you can do that with the electrodermal response. Emotional reactions to the visual changes can be tracked with electronic equipment Mm -hmm. and both people's curves will go up and down together. That means there's something connecting the experience of these two people. Okay. Otherwise the changes would happen randomly if they happened at all. But when they match, that proves that telepathy has happened. And it's really, really interesting because this can be demonstrated by anybody. Okay. You can do this. You can see the visual changes happen. You can confirm that they happen with somebody else. And if enough people start doing this exercise, mainstream science will have to like accept the fact that telepathy is real. And what is the nature of reality if telepathy is possible? I mean, it's been proven by lots of scientists, but not mainstream science, you know? mainstream when they realize there's something going on that makes us that there is a spiritual universe here you know that's the, the nature of physical reality is spiritual in, in 
at its most basic level, then the world will change. I let me recap on this. So if okay. we're doing it together, you and I in an exercise, I focus on your eye and then I slowly start to open my field of gaze. Right. Try and to it, expand your area of clear perception to include your whole face. And at some point I'm going to see a different person. Right. And when I do, do we stop or we just keep going? And well, at, at what point do we stop? What's going to happen is that the, the, the face you're looking at, when you, as you expand your area of clear perception, the face will just start to kind of distort because the, the eye is always going to be clear. You never look away from the eye. Blink whenever your eyes need wetting, but not to regain a clear focus. And if you're staring at someone's eye and you're trying to see the rest of their face as clearly as you can without looking away from the eye, you'll, the face will just start to move a little bit, start to change. And it's like, it takes a while before you see a really clear image of somebody else, uh, maybe 10 to 20 minutes. But you can see the original, the initial visual changes happen within less than a minute, usually. Does it matter which eye you're looking at? I prefer to have all the action on one side. So if, if I'm looking at your right eye, you'd be looking at my left. And you can look at either eye, but that seems to work better for me. From what I understand is the right eye projects and the left, end, left eye receives. Mm -hmm. That's not really necessary. You know, it's just one way of looking at it. I've read some stuff about that. In, I think the Don Juan books by Carlos Castaneda. Mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> but what's really interesting when you're, you're looking at someone's eye, trying to see their whole face as clearly as you can without looking away from the eye, then you start to see the person's face change. And when the face starts to look like a recognizable human being that's, that's, you know, that's different from the person you saw there, the feeling you get is that you're looking at someone else. And it's really mind-blowing when that happens, when you, oh, it's like I am looking at someone else. It, I kind of think of time is simultaneous in all of our uh, incarnations or our present, okay, because if t all time is no time it's all happening right now then all our reincarnational selves are here right now that's like the layers of an onion when you do this exercise you look at their face and you start to, to peel back the layers of the onion to see different people sometimes you'll see hats or eyeglasses or beards or even costumes you know of people in different areas they different genders different races mm. And it's like, when you start to see that, when you start to see a clear image of somebody else, it's mind blowing. Cause the feeling you get is that you're the person you're looking at just turned into someone else. Mm. It's mind blowing. What makes you think that we're seeing them in another life rather than our mind just making up something? Okay. Then this is another point I wanted to make is that because our subconscious mind is always trying to manufacture the impression of a clear image. When you first start doing this, sometimes you'll see like hallucinations. You know, it's like the because the, the brain is trying to make a recognizable picture out of all of this unfocused information. And <clears throat> sometimes you can see like monsters. And this is basically how I learned that visual telepathy actually happens. Is I was uh, I was looking at someone saying. Let me see if I can read your mind. There's a whole story here, but, and uh, <clears throat> we were just looking at each other's eyes and this woman turned into this really hideous monster. Mm. And she like backed off and said, man, you just turned into a monster. And I went, oh, wow. We both saw monsters at the same time. So the nature of what you're perceiving is gonna be the same. So if you're seeing an unpleasant image, so is the other person. All you have to do is blink or look away for a moment and it's gone. Okay, <clears throat> so the brain does try to manufacture the image of a clear perception, but the thing that makes the clear perception of what I think are reincarnational self is the way you feel when you see that picture, when you see that person in front of you look like someone else. Because, you know, if you look at two different people, they feel different. And so when the person in front of you suddenly feels like somebody else and looks like somebody else, that's that's convincing. There's no way to prove that this is a reincarnational self. 
I mean, there's no way to prove that any of us think because it's a subjective perception that we can't prove. But it sure feels like it. Can you give us some examples of the more extreme changes that you saw, you know, and felt? Oh, let me tell you about this one story. I was doing the visual telepathy exercise with this guy in uh, a coffee shop in Burbank, California. And we were sitting there watching the, all the changes happen as usual. But then everything just went black. My whole visual field just went black. And then I noticed that there was these little bubbles on the blackness that were popping, fizzing, like you know the bubbles on a glass of soda. And as the bubbles burst, I was looking at some entirely different scene. I was somewhere else. I was about six feet away from this girl in 1883, all this information just flooded into my head. This blonde girl was slowly brushing her hair, looking just kind of like she's daydreaming. And behind her was a dresser with a mirror on it. Behind the, the mirror was the, a hallway. To the left was the, the living room. To the right was the back door. The barn was about 100 feet away. On the other side of the hall was the kitchen. I knew where all the pots and pans and lanterns were kept. I just knew everything about this place all at once. And I'm just sitting there, dumbfounded. I don't know what's going on. I am somewhere else. And all of a sudden, it all just turned to chaos. Just And then it, I was back in the restaurant with my friend, and his feet are skittering around, and he's gripping onto the side of the table, just trying to get a grip on reality again. And I went, wow, what did you see? And he goes, he explained that he saw exactly the same thing from the same point of view that I did. <clears throat> and we both know all the details about the kitchen and the barn and everything. We took turns verifying the information. Like I said, the girl was wearing a yellow dress. He said, yeah, with right, white ruffles. So we, we definitely saw the same thing from the same point of view. Now, that puzzled me because I was looking at him and he was looking at me. I would think that he would be opposite of me when we saw this, but he would, we both saw it from the same point of view. So uh, the exercise turned out to be uh, kind of a window into other realms of perception. So I started calling it the psychic window technique, but I just call it visual telepathy now. Mm. But <clears throat> that's the only time anything like that's happened. You both saw the same thing. Was that yours or his? Uh, now we get into another weird story. <laughs> we wanted to know what was going on. So that night, we got out a Ouija board, and we started asking questions like, who is this, what's going on, and everything. We said, what year did it happen in? And we both had the impression it was 1883. But we asked the board, what year did, was this event happening in? And it started spelling out all these like <clears throat> uh, just weird letters like L I V, and it's like uh, we're writing it down, going, "Hey, we're looking for a number." Not all these incoherent letters, and then we realized that it was writing it all out in Roman numerals, eighteen eighty three. It's like, wow, that's impressive. But we asked, like, who is this? Is this an incarnation of one or the other of us? And it said that <clears throat> both of us, me and this other guy, were thought forms projected by that girl back then. Well, let's go on that a little deeper, because I, I don't want to let that go by. Both of you were thought forms projected by her. What, right. do, you, what do you mean by that? My impression from reading the Seth books by Jane Roberts is that we there are we can be alive more than one of us we can have more than one incarnation alive at the same time seth calls that a counterpart mm -hmm. so what this means to me is like that girl was imagining being different people in the future and incarnated as both of us alive at the same time that's the best explanation i can come up with for that mm -hmm. okay normally when you're doing this exercise does it usually play out like that where you both see the same thing? Or if you and I were doing it, I might see you as a cowboy. And then what you see me as a knight from medieval Europe. 
right? The images that you see are not going to be the same image from what I understand from this, but the nature of the image will be the same. It's like if it's a, a pleasant image to look at, the other person will be seeing a pleasant image, but you don't see the same person. It's, it's possible that you could see that each person would see the other person alive at the same time. Like if families reincarnate together, it's possible that two people in the family now would see themselves as two people in the family in some other incarnation and see each other as you were then. I don't know, because this is just visual images. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell what, what's true and what isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to be really rational about everything. So <clears throat> uh, that's the impression I get. Is it possible to communicate specific information using this technique? It is, <clears throat> but it takes some practice. Um, what you do is you you watch, you have one person think about something very specifically while you're both doing the exercise, looking at each other's eye. And when the visual changes happen, it's like whatever your feeling is about it is, it's like, say you're trying to pick a color. The other person's concentrating on a color. So you're kind of like waiting for a color to come to mind and then the visual change happens and then it's, it's more likely that, that you'll get the right color when the visual change happens. I once guessed four playing cards in a row doing this. I would guess whether it was red or black, hearts or, hearts or diamonds, spades or clubs, and then uh, a low, a mid, or a high card, and then I would guess the card. And I did that four times in a row once, just using this technique doing that. But that's pretty rare. What other psychic phenomena have you experienced? When I was younger, I experienced a lot of things like um, lucid dreaming, uh, out-of-body experience. Um, I had some reincarnational stuff happen with, with this woman that was really bizarre. Uh, we would take turns describing a scene that we were looking at. And it, it just... <laughs> And one time her and I were laying in bed next to each other and this bolt of energy came out of about two feet above me, went into my left side, out through my stomach, into her back, out through her stomach. It's like out of the blue. I mean, stuff like that happens. Uh, I once uh, had, a, I had a dream where I was seeing this image of some balls moving in a circle, but they were spiraling as they moved. And they just moved around in a circle. And I woke up and the room was dark and I walked across the room to turn on the light and I'm still seeing the image. And that was when I was working on trying to figure out how anti-gravity worked. And I, I thought that was the key to how that worked. It just came out of nowhere. One of my recent previous guests and I were talking about entities that are out there. And I think he was inferring that, you know, we only have a certain limited visual range, kind of like what you mentioned at the beginning. And that's uh -huh. perhaps why we don't see them. What is yeah. your, what is your opinion on that? I could go into this long explanation about how the boundaries of the universe are infinity. It's like the universe is infinitely large on one end and infinitely small on the other. There's the infinite past, the infinite future, the boundaries of the universe where we'll never ever be able to look beyond is infinity and infinity is a concept it's an idea yeah. nothing physical can be infinite just it can't you know no matter how long you you try to make something it's never going to reach the end so infinity is an idea so every if the boundaries of the universe are an idea everything inside that universe has to be an idea too it's just like we were living in a highly structured dream because if anybody suddenly woke up in bed right now, they would have to, they'd be convinced that they just dreamed what they had experienced because we can't tell the difference. It's like a reality only exists from the perspective of someone inside of that reality. So when you're in a dream, there is no physical reality. When you're here physically, there is no dream reality. It's, it's a fantasy. And it works both ways. Mm -hmm. So what exactly was your question? Oh, why we don't, we don't see this stuff. Everything is happening now at once. 
you know, just everything is now. And that means the past is here, the, the future is here, and there are other entities here. The entire universe is right in front of us. So uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it's, there are rational explanations for why the universe has to be made of some kind of ideas. Since we were talking about reincarnation, what are your thoughts on what happens to us after we die? Oh, well, anybody that's watched your channel knows what happens. There's hundreds of stories of people explaining almost the same thing. Um, <clears throat> but so I, I can't really add to that. You know, it's, time is simultaneous. There's another side. We plan our life when we come, before we come here. Well, do you believe there's a God? Uh, it depends on how you want to define God. Uh, my belief is that everything is conscious. And if God is everything, then God is aware of every moment of every person's life. It's like uh, Rumi had a quote. He says, we are not a drop in the ocean of consciousness. We are the ocean in a drop. It just means that we're all God experiencing the universe through our present personalities. This is how God knows itself. So <clears throat> that's kind of how I think of what, what God is. Would you consider yourself to be psychic? No. I'm aware that this stuff happens, that it's real. And every once in a while, I will, because I'm aware of it, I'll notice something. Oh. Yeah, okay, I know what's going on in that situation. Somebody thinking something or whatever. But in general, no. It's like there are psychics who like know things, you know, who can tune into a deceased people or whatever. It's like I have no abilities like that. Do you believe in astrology? And if so, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I was an astrologer for about 20 years where I took it pretty seriously. I tried to do it professionally for a while, but people were asking me questions like, should I leave my husband? And it's like, that's not for me to tell. And uh, my perspective on astrology is that it works extremely well for determining personality. It's uh, my chart just nails me exactly. And I can, I, I used to do this for other people all the time. And they would all agree, yeah, it nails personality. But when I try to uh, predict events and stuff, it's like most of the time, it's pretty useless, in my opinion. I mean, maybe somebody has better skills, you know, mm -hmm. but I was pretty good at it, but predicting events didn't work very well. Yeah, I know you can get pretty deep into it. I mean, it's much more than just Gemini and, you know, whatever, and this is what's going to happen today. I mean, there's all these sun signs and moon signs and all kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah, the way astrology works is that uh, every planet has a meaning. Uh, astrology is like a map of the, the universe with the Earth in the middle and the sky on the outside and the planets all going around. And that little map is divided into 12 pie shaped sections called houses. So every house has a meaning. Every sign like Aries, Taurus, Gemini has a, has a meaning. Uh, every planet has a meaning and the angles between the planets have a meaning. When you put all those together uh, with a chart that is a map of the sky when someone was born, you get a lot of personality characteristics like certain planets will will have more influence on the person's personality. And it works really, really well for that. I don't know why. Do you think then if somebody is born in the same city on the same day, are they going to have the same personality? It'll be really, really similar. Do you believe in the law of attraction? I believe that it works, uh, but I have totally failed to make it work in my life because I'm very rational. So I try to break everything down into cause and effect and what's going on. For some reason, I can't make it work, but I'm convinced it works. So I don't know how, how to explain that any better than that. It's just, it's like the overall events and conditions that happen. It's like they seem to match my core beliefs, but all of the efforts that I've made to try to like make this happen and I've spent like tons of creative visualization trying to make things happen never work but that doesn't mean that 
the law of attraction doesn't work. It means that my core beliefs are preventing what I want to happen from happening. Mm. I, I would be happy to say it doesn't work because it hasn't worked for me, but I'm convinced it does. Would you consider yourself more of a scientist or a spiritualist? I'm not a scientist, but I try to understand the nature of reality in a rational way. And there is evidence to support that all of this is an illusion, that there's a structure to it. The word meta means beyond. So metaphysical means beyond the physical. So metaphysics deals with the, the laws that are happening that, that cause the laws of physics to work. But all of this is going on on some other level. You know, it's like the universe acts like a machine, but it never breaks. Time never stops for a minute. It goes backwards. Gravity doesn't just fail for a second. Any machine breaks. Okay? There's something controlling all of this. And uh, anybody who thinks that the physical universe is all there is just isn't aware of enough information. So do you think that just our physical world is an illusion or everything, the entire universe, the astral world included, is that an illusion as well? My belief is that everything is made from consciousness, that there's just this one huge consciousness that it's all that is, and it's conscious. And there's, there's no time, and there's no space, that all of this is a perception mm. that's created by metaphysical laws to say, okay, we're going to pretend that there's time and space and physical matter has to interact this way because that's the way the, the rules are set up. But it's all idea construction. If we keep coming back and reincarnating, why do we do that? I think that we're all God being who we are so that God can know who it is, right? It's like we are expressions of God learning things, going through our struggles, going through our adventures as just so that God can have some kind of experience. Like I think that like in the beginning there was only God and God was bored because there's nothing to do with it. There's n nothing anywhere. And so God <clears throat> divided itself so that it would create like someone else. And then God wasn't alone. And that was cool. Only God knew that both of these were God. So it was kind of pointless. So like God would take away the memory of being God from other and other would suddenly experience being with God and be all cool. Wow, this is amazing. Who are you? And it's like, God goes, ah, that's cool. I like that experience. And so it's like God just divided itself into this multitude of different individuals who are all experiencing uh, their individual perception of what reality is. And eventually we evolve back to the point where we realize we're God. <clears throat> it's kind of esoteric way of looking at it. After you discovered the phenomenon of visual telepathy, how did it change you as a person? Oh, uh, you got time for a little story? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I first discovered that telepathy was real when me and a friend were sitting in a car in my dad's driveway at night smoking hashish. And we decided to, I was 17 years old, and we decided to see if we could communicate a letter of the alphabet with telepathy, even though we didn't know how. And it's like, I, okay, well, let's try this. And so I, we both closed our eyes. I concentrated on the letter and just kept visualizing it in my mind. And I was pretty high, so I could like see the letter. I would make it three dimensional, uh, <clears throat> uh, put like ruffled edges on the side, rotate it. And this is, I kept concentrating on this letter and uh, about five minutes had gone by and he hadn't guessed yet. And I was just getting really frustrated. And finally, I just said, just get it in my mind. I said, get it through your head. The letter is R. He screamed and I went, wow, because that was the letter. And that blew me away. There was no doubt that he had picked that up tele telepathically, and that meant that telepathy was real. And when I realized telepathy was real, that changed my whole world because, you know, 
hardcore science says none of that's possible. Hardcore science is wrong. <laughs> so it's like, now I have to like go on this quest to find out what the nature of reality really is. And I started reading metaphysical books and stuff like that. And I also learned to do the visual telepathy thing by just walking up to people saying, let me see if I can read your mind. <laughs> And they'd look at me in, in the eye, and and I would start telling them, uh, well, what would I say? Imagine I'm, I come up to you and I say, okay, look me in the eye, and let me see if I can read your mind. First thing that's going to go through your mind is, there's no way you can read my mind. Mm -hmm. So I would say, there's no way you're thinking that there's no way I can read your mind. I'm right. And they go, yeah, but that's obvious. And I had this routine where I'd go through a bunch of things that were obvious that people were going to think and then finally i they would they would concentrate on something specific to prove that i couldn't tell what they were thinking but by that time they were so concerned that i might be able to read their mind that they projected the energy of that thought or idea so strongly i could pick it up uh, one example is uh, this girl was thinking about the slippers her grandmother kept under her bed so I was picking up stuff like that. I'm 17 years old, hanging out in a coffee shop with all, all my friends would come by and say, hey, you know, let the mind reader do his trick. So I'd do my trick, blow their minds. They'd run away because they thought I could read all their deep, dark secrets, which I couldn't. But after two weeks, I had no friends because they all thought I could read their mind. Oh, that's and, too bad. Uh, I, had to quit, I had to quit doing it so that I could have friends. It took two months before treated, people treated me like a human being again. Is there anything else that you can share with us about the nature of reality? One thing is that essentially any two people can do the visual telepathy thing and see mind-blowing results in just a few minutes. It will convince you that you're merging your perceptions with somebody else. And if science can become aware that it's that simple to do and it can be proven with that electrodermal response test, if mainstream science ever becomes aware of it, telepathy is real, it would change science in the same way that my worldview changed when I realized telepathy was real, when I communicated the letter of the alphabet. It's like everything changes when you realize there's something else going on. And there's more than just telepathy going on. There's outer body experience, life after death. There's all kinds of things that mainstream science ignores. And it's like, I just... I hope enough people start doing this that it's like mainstream science has to look into it. Yeah, it seems that if you can't measure it or see it, then mainstream science doesn't really have an interest in it unless some scientist has an experience. Yeah, even then, they're after evidence, repeatable evidence, but that, they can do that with the electrodermal response, with the telepathy, mm -hmm. they can prove that happening. Mm -hmm. But... <clears throat> They have to have an, an explanation for what is at the end of the universe. <laughs> you know, they just go, we don't know. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not an answer. What's out there is a concept called infinity. You have mm -hmm. to understand that's what it is. There is something there. It's infinity. Infinity is an idea. The whole universe is contained in an idea. But science just says, we don't know what's out there. And they stop asking mm -hmm. questions. I have read that our brains do not even have the capability of understanding infinity. Infinity is impossible. That's why we can't understand it. It's impossible. It's like if you have, let's say we, we draw, we take, line up a, a row of apples that's infinitely long. It goes out past the sun, past the galaxy, past the edge of the observable universe. This row of apples still has an infinite distance to go. Now we take another row of oranges that's just infinitely long. We line it up right next to that. And then we say, let's push these oranges and apples together so that the line we end up with is twice as long. Mm -hmm. But it's the same length because it's infinite. It can't be twice as long and the same length at the same time because infinity cannot exist. Mm -hmm. It's an idea. And so that's what's at the end of the universe. It's not, we don't know what's there. It is infinity. We don't, it's an idea. It's like, <clears throat> okay, what does that mean about everything contained within this idea? It also has to be an idea. So 
That's my point of view. All right. If someone wants to learn more about this technique and more, they can get your book called Rational Spirituality. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Yeah. You can get it at Amazon or anywhere else you want to order it. I said in the beginning that you've published five books. What are your four other books? Uh, there's another one called Coda Psychic Party Games, which is a chapter from the Rational Spirituality book, uh, plus the uh, stuff about telekinesis. I mean, uh, visual telepathy. And uh, <clears throat> that's got some interesting stuff in it, like uh, the lifting game is where people can lift someone out of a chair using just two fingers. Uh, a thing I call psychic touch dancing, where two people put their hands against each other like this, and the hands will move with neither person controlling them. Uh, there's using a pendulum to get yes or no answers to questions. Uh, psychometry, where you can charge an object with some emotional energy and pass it around, see if people can tell what that is. Just a bunch of things people can do. Uh, at a party, you know, more than one person can do it together. Hmm. And then uh, I wrote a novel called The Change under a pen name, D.C. Candy, with an I, C-A-N-D-I. And it's a metaphysical, supernatural, sci-fi, fantasy, gender-bending thriller. Uh, it is pretty entertaining. <clears throat> uh, I wrote a book... Uh, called Changing the World. This is actually kind of a booklet. Back when the uh, Occupy Wall Street thing was happening, I had a lot of ideas about fixing the world that I uh, talk about. And I, I wrote that, so probably get some information out there. But things like uh, having uh, one worldwide government so we can stop having wars and the threat of nuclear <laughs> destruction. Uh, one building cities so that we can consolidate everything into nice, clean, comfortable places to live with uh, parks and gardens and farms around it. Uh, one idea I really put a lot of value in is the Personal Freedoms Protection Amendment. Behavior expressed in the pursuit of happiness, which does not force others to participate against their will, is an unalienable right of the people. That means, hey, I get to own my body, stuff like that. So what else? Uh, oh, there's one called Word Art. That is just a bunch of uh, song lyrics, visual art I've done, uh, stories, poems, things like that. Now, you're also a musician. Can we find your books and your music on your website? Yeah, my website is codasplace.com. K-O-D-A-S-P-L-A-C-E dot com. And uh, you can find links to it. The, uh, the music I like the best is under the band name Psychic Trance for three words. And if you like Pink Floyd, you'll like that stuff. It sounds nothing like them, but it's, uh, I'm proud of that stuff. It's, it took a long time to put it together. And uh, yeah. There's other music too, but you can you can stream the psychic transfer stuff on uh, Spotify. All right. Well, you've got the books, you've got the music. What else are you up to that you want us to know about? I'm working on a novel now. It's called The Reality Game, which is uh, this quantum computer machine it allows people to experience an entire lifetime in six hours. It's kind of set up like. Um, the between lives thing where you create the life here only we're here we're creating life in the machine and that's kind of a fun thing to work with also on your website there's information about audio animation can you tell us about that that's a pretty cool idea i came up with <clears throat> uh, if i snap my fingers or if you snap your fingers you can tell where the sound comes from because of the way the sound waves strike your eardrums it hits this one first before it hits this one it's louder here before than it is here. There's more high frequency content here than it is over here. So there are variables in the sound that tell you where it comes from. So if you snap your fingers while continue, if you move your arm in a big circular pattern while continually snapping your fingers, you will hear a circle. That's a picture you see with your ears. Now you can hear sounds above you, you know, behind you, below you all at once. So it's possible to create that circle 
in front of you and behind you or behind you, and you don't have to turn your head to see it. You can create three-dimensional sound shapes with this process. So like a rotating triangle or a bunch of circles coming toward you make you feel like you're going through a, a tunnel. It's like, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of interesting things. So I spent 10 years trying to get financing for that and finally gave up and published it in a few music industry magazines and, and haven't done anything with it. But it's pretty cool. It's a mm. nice idea to play around with. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions or chit chat with you. Are you open to that? And if so, how can they reach you? Yeah, I'm uh, happy to talk to anybody. Uh, you can find me at codasplace.com or facebook.com slash codasplace. So just send me a message if you want. All right, Coda, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yeah, after trying to figure out what life is about forever, I think I finally figured it out what the answer is, what's true success means. And that success is loving life. To get up in the morning, looking forward to a new day and whatever adventures might happen. It's like children do that. It's like everything's an adventure. If you can get up every day feeling great about your life, just excited to be alive, that's the meaning of success. And, you know, why not? That's a great message. Coda, thank you so much for being my guest today. I really appreciate you, and I wish you the best. Yeah, thank you very much. I had a good time. All right, me too, and take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.